Hi, my name is Chris Ralph, and this is part two of the geology of placer gold deposits. We're going to talk about doing research to find your own locations where you can find placer gold for yourself. Now we're going to talk about what it takes to do that kind of research and the details of it. And you can find your own mineralized areas and uh, be successful at finding your own gold. It's this kind of research and kind of work that makes the really more successful guys more successful. So look, their gold is still out there. There are big finds being made, nice patches with multiple ounces and sometimes really big nuggets. But exploring and prospecting are how big finds are made. Remember the old prospector with his mule? Well, that's an image that's in all kinds of old movies and stories and the like. But there's a truth to it. It's something that modern day prospectors need to remember. That's that the old prospector was always wandering around. He was testing different places, trying out different ideas, trying to make that big strike. Well, you know, a lot of guys, even today and, and even sometimes uh, pretty experienced prospectors, get stuck going to the same old places over and over and over. And the problem is, you know, even if you had great luck there at the beginning, you know, the gold isn't, it doesn't grow back. It doesn't just suddenly reoccur. Once you've taken it out, it's out. And um, the secret of this is, is getting around and finding new places. Well, how do you find new places? How do you find new places where you can find lots of gold? Learn to do research. And uh, you can read and, and uh, study maps and, and find what you need to know. And uh, in so doing, you'll learn the skills of prospecting because, well, what you know counts for a lot. Now, like I said, great finds are still being made. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Research will tell you where to begin your hunt for gold. Now, gold comes from sources in the ground like veins or fault zones, stock works or seams. And we're going to cover that kind of topic more thoroughly in part three. But for this part, we're going to talk about how to do research to find those places. Now, like I say again, it's still out there, but don't get the wrong idea. Uh, you know, there's a reason why uh, gold sells for roughly about $1,300 an ounce as I'm recording this. There's a reason why gold, for sell gold sells for that high price, and it's because gold is rare. It's not super easy to find, and it's not like something where you're just going to go out there and, you know, randomly fall over and, and uh, pick up a, a giant nugget and you're just going to stumble onto really big finds. Really big finds are out there, but it takes some work. And I could tell people prospecting is like a trade. You know, owning a pipe wrench doesn't make you a commercial plumber. It's a plumber's knowledge and experience and know-how that make him the master of his trade. And it's the same thing for prospectors. You know, just owning a shovel or a gold pan, a metal detector, a sluice box, a dry washer, just owning those things is like owning a pipe wrench or some other uh, tool of the, pro of the plumbing trade. Just because you own it doesn't mean you know how to use it to its best extent. And uh, what, what I'm trying to do is up you guys in the knowledge category so that, you know, you can take those tools and use them like a journeyman prospector and get out there and be successful. Now, what does it take to find your own gold? Well, you have to be able to physically get out there, and that counts both physically, you know, able to hike and, and uh, dig and do whatever, but also the time, you know. Sometimes, uh, I've had times in my life where I was committed to job and kids and everything else to such a degree that, you know, I just physically couldn't get out there very often. You have to have knowledge of where gold is concentrated. You just can't go out there and throw a dart and, Hope that it'll land right on top of a big nugget. Um, you have to have some access to productive ground. And sometimes that's through clubs, but sometimes it's through doing your own research. You have to have the equipment, but you know it doesn't have to be super expensive stuff. Um, you have to have a good positive attitude and persistence. You know, a lot of guys that I've met uh, get out there and they 
do a little prospecting they have in their mind that they're going to be finding you know three four ounces of gold a week and and that's just going to be how it is and you know they, they have no idea what reality looks like and when they get out there and reality smacks them in the face and they find out that they're working hard for ten dollars worth of gold a week they give up real fast what you got to do is hang in there because there's a learning curve to this all and you know it takes time to learn these things it takes time to gain experience and it takes time to gain confidence that you need to be able to go out there and find your own gold a little research really makes a big difference. So where will you go to look for gold? You know, doing research begins with determining the kinds of locations in your area that have produced gold in the past. You know, you can go look for totally new areas and sometimes you can find areas that are kind of forgotten. You know, and maybe they were even worked by the old timers, but you know, it's a small productive area and you know, it's not well, well documented. And, it's, and sometimes those things can be found. And we're going to talk a little bit how to do that sort of thing. But really, I recommend starting with areas that have produced gold in the past and then doing your research from there. You can go out and look for other things or, you know, peripheral areas and that sort of thing. We'll talk a little bit about that, like I say. But uh, start with the areas that produced gold in the past. Now, research continues with finding out about how much gold was produced historically and from what kinds of sources. Finally, you research access and roads and what you'll likely find when you get there. And, uh, you know, that way you'll have a good idea when you actually go out and put your boots on the ground. So in preparation for that, let's take a look at the gold districts of a few western states. We'll just quickly go through some of these because obviously... You know, you may live in one of these states, but, you know, I'm going to go through several different states, and some of those states may be states that you've never prospected or maybe never even will. Now, this is the Placer Gold area, areas of Arizona, and you'll note that, for the most part, the northeast quadrant of the state just doesn't have a whole lot to offer. That's because the geology up there if there was anything, it would be down so deep that you'd never be able to see it. I mean, it would be buried with thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks that just don't have much gold in them. And actually, there's a, a lot of uh, gold-producing area in the area around Prescott and some more in the area around Tucson. And there's some others scattered, of course, uh, up by Kingman also in the general region there in Mojave County. There's a number of areas that have been productive. In Nevada, we have some gold uh, areas scattered across the state, although the more productive areas in Nevada are more in the northern part of the state than in the southern. But there's still gold in the southern part. I'm not trying to say that there isn't any gold in the southern part of the state. I'm just saying that there's a lot more districts in the northern part. California has a real interesting pattern. You can see the foothills of the Sierra are just, there's a, you know, these are dots or gold mines, and there's just solid dots going up and down the foothills of the Sierra. And then up in the northwest quadrant of the state, there's the, the Humboldt Trinity region, where there's an awful lot of gold that's been mined. And then in the southern part of the state, out in the desert areas, you can see that gold is scattered here and there, and... Um, it's pretty extensive across the state, but it, it tends to be scattered. And there's some good districts in the southern part of California. It's just uh, not as intensely mineralized for such a long, large area. Still, like I say, there's good areas to prospect in Southern California. Um, Oregon gold districts. Well, Oregon, as you can see, is pretty much divided into two clumps. One is the clump up toward Baker in the northeast part of the state, and the other is the clump uh, toward the uh, south uh, southwest part of the state. It basically is the northern extension of the Humboldt Trinity uh, area in, in California. That gold-bearing region continues to the north, and uh, you know arbitrary state lines don't uh, change geology, and if, if geology continues the same, 
going further in one direction, then you'll you'll see deposits continue just as well. And, and that's kind of the story of the uh, southwestern part of the state of Oregon. Now, Montana is a very big state. Montana is actually the, the fourth largest state in the union. But uh, you can see that the bulk of the gold districts are concentrated in one area in the southwest part of the state. Now, there's a few scattered other ones uh, that you can see on the map, but uh, the bulk of them, the, the big producers really for the most part, are in that, uh, that area around Helena and uh, some of those places around there that uh, have been your more productive zones. Alaska. You know, there's Alaska is a huge, huge state, and and a map like this does just doesn't do it justice. But there are a number of districts that uh, have been very productive. Um, a, a number of them, you know, up around Fairbanks and Nome, and and the, but there's just a number of areas that have been very productive across the state of Nevada. One of the, I'm sorry, the state of Alaska. But one of the things that's actually really interesting about Alaska is the State Bureau of Mines and Geology that, that produces maps like this and, and has information. A lot of their stuff is available online and you can just actually go to their website and, and uh, download all kinds of information about gold mining in the state of Alaska. Idaho, you can kind of see... Uh, that uh, toward the middle part of the state is where the bulk of the gold bearing districts are uh, scattered through the midsection kind of of the state a few further north and a few further to the southeast but uh, the bulk of them are in that middle part of the state and uh, there's been some major gold produced in the state of Idaho it's uh, been a very productive district and finally uh, looking at the last state you know there's a lot of states and I could have covered more but you know it covered maps and go on forever uh, but I think this is enough to give us a, an initial survey that shows us um, areas where gold mining districts were and this is the state of Colorado and you can see that the gold mining districts most of them anyway line up in a kind of uh, northeast to southwest kind of line going across the middle part of the state and uh, it's kind of an interesting concept but uh, there's a large areas there that have been very productive. Colorado has been a very productive state as far as gold is concerned. But for each of these states, there is information available that you can research to find out about where placer gold has been found in more detail. You know, where you can get on and uh, do research and find out, well, you know, what about the so-and-so area and how much gold did that actually produce? And what kind of mines were there that uh, that the the miners were able to work? You know, what kind of, of ore or gravel or, or whatever was successful in uh, producing gold? And that kind of stuff is really worthwhile information to know, because it it makes a difference whether you're going to a district that's produced, you know, maybe a couple thousand ounces of gold total, or another district that's maybe produced. 100,000 ounces or 500,000 ounces. Uh, for the most part, a lot of times, and sometimes there's lost and little known things, but a lot of times the more productive ones are maybe more likely to have a few crumbs that the old timers left behind, or a few nuggets that they left behind scattered here and there. Now, research to determine favorable rock types and the use of geologic maps. Look, books can tell you, and a lot of guys don't like doing book study. Hey, you're not in school anymore, and you don't want to do homework. Okay, uh, that's that's your choice, and I'll do the homework and go out and find the gold. Um, but books can tell you a lot about where gold is coming from, and that's a really critical thing. And when you go out in the field, you want to know where is that gold coming from, for the most part. Um, and geologic maps can tell you that kind of stuff. You know, they may tell you that a certain type of rock is the host for all the gold deposits in the so-and-so district. Well, now you can use a geologic map to find out where the outcrops of that host rock are. Or maybe certain types of deposits or certain types of rock contacts, you know, where maybe one type of rock meets or contacts another has been the, the main source of the gold. And 
knowing that and being able to look on a geologic map and see where those contacts are and where they go can tell you a lot. And that's the kind of thing that can help you find lost or extensions or peripheral areas that most people don't know about. And you can go out there and find something that maybe hasn't been worked or hasn't been worked to death. Fault zone extensions, you know, fall in the same category. Um, a lot of places, uh, gold occurs along a fault zone that uh, may be the, the real source where the gold is coming from, the nuggets are coming from. And using a geologic map will help you see where those fault zones go. Now we're going to talk more about favorable host geology in, in part three. So I'm going to kind of leave this issue alone, but know that we'll get back to it in the next, uh, the next part of this series. Now I'm going to look at some of the things that I use. And this is a book called Gold Districts of California. It's Bulletin 193. And it can still be purchased. Uh, you can buy copies of it. And uh, there's. it also refers in the book, what you'll have is a description of, of each district and where the gold was taken from and a little bit about the geology. And then it will often have little footnotes of where additional information can be found. And in, in most... Uh, for most Bureau of Mines and that sort of thing, they produce county or, or district reports that tell about um, further detail about the mines and, and the production of a certain area. And so you can get some of those. And some of that stuff is, is actually online. Like I say, Alaska makes almost all of their stuff available. But even for other counties, there's, there's stuff that's available online that you can do research with and, and find a lot of information. And... You know, if there's some book that you think is going to be really helpful, there's a lot of library exchange programs and other things where you can somehow get access to some of these old books. You may get access to a, a book written by a geologist in 1885 who was actually out there and saw what the miners were doing. And that can give you a lot of really interesting information. So these divisions of mines and their various bulletins and, and, uh, reports can be really interesting and, and really helpful as far as generating ideas of where you want to go prospect. Now different kinds of maps can be really helpful. There's topo maps and geologic maps and aerial photos or, or satellite photos. Uh, maps are an important source of information. They can tell you stuff that uh, can't be found anywhere else like you know where's the nearest road? Um, you know, from a topo map, you can see how, how what's the topography like? Is you know, are you going to be have to climb up a cliff, or is it just kind of walking over rolling hills? Uh, that's kind of information that you can get. Um, and maps can be obtained from the internet, from various books and libraries. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online these days. It's just amazing what you can find as far as maps and and other similar sorts of things. Now here's a topographic map, a little chunk of an area in Arizona. Uh, this is White Elephant Wash that's been very productive. Oh, lots of gold have been found by prospectors out in this area, both dry washing and with metal detectors. And this is an official USGS map. It's much larger than this. I've only just taken a little slice of it just in the heart of an area that's produced a lot of gold. Um, some details are not plotted on the map. You know, not every little prospect it can be seen on a map. And um, a lot of these can be downloaded. But it, it's, it's kind of different. You know, sometimes some of these maps seem to show a lot of little roads and stuff. And other maps, I think the guys who made them were, you know, they were in a hurry to get off for their lunch break. And, and so they just kind of covered a few things and said, oh, good enough. Um, but anyway, these maps are very helpful, especially when you're going out to an area for the first time. Boy, the, the mountains and hills drawn on it can help you orient yourself and figure out where you are. And, and even when there's a lot more roads than show on the map, it's still good to have something that can be helpful to you as far as maps. Now, aerial photos, these days, it's just amazing what's available. Um, 
there's just so much information and uh, Google Earth has just revolutionized uh, this thing. Now, this is an area that uh, I have found some gold in. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, but it's it's in the mountains in the California. And in the center part, there's a light colored area that kind of heads east west and then turns and heads uh, toward the uh, southwest. And along that light colored section, that's the, the bed of a stream. Um, some friends and I have gotten some nice gold over the years. A lot of it's on the smaller side, but uh, a mix of some good, nice nuggets and, and then uh, also finer stuff. So it's been a productive area and it's, it's a really interesting place. And th there was a road in from what is the northwest on this map up and you can look in the northwest corridor and see a faint little road. And the road head down, headed down to this uh, area and what happened was this was the road we normally came in on and a big tree fell across the road it was like a pine tree that the trunk was like four feet in diameter just too big for us to to come in with any chainsaw we owned and cut our way in so we were kind of stuck and it was a long ways to walk from out there so i went on uh, google earth and surprise there's a road to the south that comes, you can see the road that twists along and just comes around to the south. And it's only a few hundred yards walk from this road right down to the area. So uh, suddenly uh, having to walk hill and dale a long ways, we had a short walk right down into the middle of where we wanted to work. And so this was very helpful to us uh, to just to know that the road is up there. And that's the kind of stuff you can learn from Google Earth. Because like I say, not everything is plotted on topo maps. Sometimes, for whatever reason, they just leave stuff off. And this is a, an interesting area that uh, was helpful to us to, to be able to look at it from above. You know, looking at things from above, uh, especially on new areas where you're coming in, it can be so helpful to just have a good idea of what it looks like. You know, is it heavily treed? Is it an open desert? Um, are there lakes or whatever nearby? You know, that kind of stuff can just be invaluable to know. Now, here is the topo map for that same little area. And you can see there's uh, not much showing as far as roads. It's missing uh, a lot of the major roads and even the mine workings that go along this section of the river. There's a little square there alongside the stream. And that apparently was a cabin at one time, but that cabin is gone. An open square like that on these topo maps means a, an abandoned or wrecked cabin, and there, there's not even the remains of that anymore. Okay, so let's talk some more about geologic maps. There's a lot of different sources and different types um, that have different accuracies, but it's amazing what you, again, what you can download off the internet these days. There's all kinds of levels of accuracy and scale. The more detail, of course, the better. Um, there's an issue of, you know, where were the, the maps derived from? How did they figure out what rock was where? You know, was it based on just geologists reviewing uh, aerial photos? Or was there uh, very much on-site inspection where they actually had boots on the ground looking at different kinds of rocks? Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is recognizing rock types in the field, and that's going to be a, a big part of the next section, the part three. Um, you can use geology handbooks and, and other sorts of things. I'm going to recommend that, uh, like I say, in the next part. We'll talk more detail about that kind of stuff. Now here is a map of the southern part of the Mother Load country in California. And you can see a, a big body of purple rock and then a kind of smaller bodies of purple rock. Um, and then along the purple rocks are black lines. The black lines in this are faults. Those are fault zones. And the purple rock is um, a rock called serpentine. And in, in real life, it's green. It's not purple. It's just the color uh, uh, coding on this map uh, makes the, the rocks purple. That, that type of rock designated as purple. But in real life, it's, it's a green, green, gray kind of color. Um, but this is a type of rock which is 
well known among prospectors in California, at least ones that are active in the mother load, that the contact of this ultra basic rock, the serpentine, with metamorphic rocks like slate or schist or something like that, uh, even uh, other types of rock, for the most part, slate and schist is the what it contacts with. Those zones have been very productive. And now, not every inch of the fault zone where it contacts with some sort of other rock is a big producer, but there's a huge number of places that have been very productive, both for old miners that, uh, you know, went out there and hydraulic mined or whatever, but also for modern day prospectors armed with metal detectors and sluice boxes and the like. Um, this is a contact that's very valuable in the mother load country. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a case study here for you. We're going to talk about the Randsburg and El Paso uh, Mountains. It's a well-known placer and hard rock area in Southern California. And it's a, a place that's been very productive for metal detectors. And yet, uh, there's some vastly different geology around in different places, uh, comparing, say, Randsburg and Stringer area to the south and versus the El Paso Mountains, uh, Summit Diggings, and Goler, um, the Goler uh, Gulch area. Now, this is an area that produces some big gold. Uh, this 156 ounce nugget that's in the picture here is, as far as I know, the largest nugget that's ever been found with a metal detector in California. In fact, it's the largest nugget found with a metal detector, I think, in the USA. Um, and it came from the Stringer area here, south of Randsburg. And there's regularly uh, nuggets, uh, large nuggets being uh, found. We had a 10 ouncer on the cover of our magazine, the magazine I worked for a few years back. So I did some research on this area. And the first thing I did was grab that California bulletin number 193 that I mentioned earlier, the gold deposits or gold districts of California and read what it said about these two mining districts. Then I went to the library and got some old reports that were referenced in, uh, in the Bolton 193, and I made some copies of some old geologic maps. I downloaded some topo maps and aerial photos off the internet so that I could do my research. Here's what I found out. I read in an old report that there are basically two very different sources for placer gold in this area of the northwestern Mojave Desert. One is placers that are associated with the erosion of load deposits in an ancient schist associated with granitic intrusions. These are most commonly the type of placers found in the Randsburg and Stringer area. It also is similar to the gold found in the Atolia area even further to the south. The gold in from these places is sharp and angular because it's not traveled far. The geology of these placers are somewhat similar to many placer deposits in Arizona that are also associated with Precambrian ancient, ancient schists and the granitic intrusions. So a lot of the, you know, um, the Mojave County placers and even the uh, Yavapai area is similar geologically to this. The second source, though, in that region is very different. The second type was associated with a conglomerate uh, called the Ricardo Formation. And these placers have been reconcentrated and are found in several places in the El Paso range. The gold is notably smoother and definitely shows signs of travel. According to this old report, wherever the writer examined the modern streams that had cut through this Ricardo sedimentary formation to its base, gold had been found. Uh, Well-known significant placers of this type include the ones at Goler Gulch and Last Chance and Bonanza Gulches, as well as uh, Summit Diggings in, in that area. Here's an area topo map. This is a larger scale topo map, which shows the area, uh, major areas. The area in red in the southeast part of this map is the area around Randsburg and Stringer that's produced gold. The green marked areas in the northern half of the map are the ones associated with this Ricardo formation. The uh, farthest one to the right being summit diggings. 
Now, this is what I found. The area with iron-stained rocks, this iron-stained um, old, uh, basically this is a Precambrian schist, and the yellow on this map is a quartz monzonite, which is a granitic rock. And you can see that uh, the red part of the area is where placer gold has been found, and also hard rock gold as well. Um, the schist near the uh, mineralization is the most favorable. Now, um, to the east, there's uh, clay and sandstone. You see the kind of bluish, greenish uh, type of stuff. That is younger rocks that's buried over the uh, gold-bearing schist. And so what's happened there is it's just been covered over, so there's not the... Uh, the surface gold deposits that are worthwhile mining. Now here's a zoom in a uh, higher level of accuracy. You can see Randsburg and Johannesburg on the northern edge of the map and this stringer area which is where that uh, 156 ounce uh, nugget was uh, taken is this general area. There's other information available. I, I got this uh, little map from a Kern County report that the California Bureau of Mines did. And it shows a number of areas where they've found uh, gold placers and, and that sort of thing in the El Paso range. Here's some more maps uh, of the area. There's uh, basically different uh, designations uh, as far as areas where they found gold in the past. Um, the Kern County report that I mentioned has all kinds of information on different mines, both placer and hard rock. And I got just one page here as an example, but there's many, many pages covering all in detail different mines and different places where placer gold was worked. And this kind of stuff is just invaluable as far as doing research for areas to explore and to go out and find gold. Now here's a kind of a zoom in geologic map of the area. Um, it shows the Randsburg schist in the south section of the, uh, the map. The south uh, would be the southeast. And then uh, in the section to the north, the, you, there's the El Paso range. And there's a kind of a, a light medium brown area that's basically that sedimentary rock that has the gold in the lowest level. And like I say, drainages that cut through that have exposed potential placer gold. So there's no super one way, perfect way to do research. Uh, you literally, you start with a location book that tells you about gold districts or where placer gold has been found in a certain state. And you do research related to areas that you're interested in. Um, determine what the, the gold source is. What, what is the host of the gold in that area? Where does the gold come from? That's a real key concept that you can use to build upon and get ideas of far, as far as where you should be looking. Uh, collect maps, both topographic and aerial, geologic. Check out various sources. You know, out-of-print maps can sometimes be great. Um, there's a lot of information online. Uh, compare various map scales for extra in. Uh, information. You know, the closer down the scale, the more information they generally have. And uh, read these maps and, and put together ideas for uh, useful information. Um, once you put that all together, you can select some target sites for field exploration, places you want to go when you get out there. Um, find favorable layers that are favorable areas that are on the outskirts. I mentioned that on the periphery of a lot of these districts, there may be little known spots that haven't received the kind of uh, examination that they really deserve. Um, you know, create GPS coordinates. You know, if, if you use maps and they have the ability to uh, designate a GPS coordinate, some, a lot of the ones online do, you know, you can say, hey, I'm interested in this spot right here. You can generate GPS coordinates that you can use to place yourself right there when you get out in the field. That's really handy. And then, of course, do your field exploration. Get out there and evaluate the target sites. Don't stop at the first one. Keep looking. Keep trying. 
You know, remember that old prospector that kept wandering from place to place. You know, if you want to be a prospector, then you're going to have to wander from place to place. Determine if, you know, there's detectable or dry washable gold and uh, look for new, new patches, new spots where you might be successful in finding gold. And that's how research works. Finding the right location is the toughest part. There's, there's no one single perfect way. Um, you can go, like I say, back to the same old places, but the gold doesn't grow back and you end up chasing crumbs. Um, you know, sometimes it's fun to do that, uh, but the search for new spots and new patches is much harder, but the rewards are greater. Like I say, the big finds are being made in places that people are doing research and going out there and, and finding the gold. You know, sometimes, you know, gold can be found in areas that have been beat to death, but the big finds and, and the big patches and the lots of nuggets are being found in places that have not received as much attention. So location books, those are just the start of the journey. Research means read, 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 and homework, even if you don't like homework. Still, it's an interesting story. You know, there's a lot of history in these things. Um, get into it and, and understand, you know, the stories and, and experience it for yourself and then get out into the field and explore. You know, clubs are, are a good thing, especially new guys. I urge people to get involved. Uh, every, virtually every club I've ever seen, 10% uh, of the people do 90% of the work. So clubs are always looking for people to jump in and help. So if you want to join a club, you know, Roll up your sleeves and jump on in and participate. Now, like I say, I assure you that there's still gold out there to be found. Will you do what it takes to get your share? It takes work. You may not like homework, but good finds are still being made out there to those who have the prospecting skills and are willing to put in the time and work to be successful. Now, for more information, I want to note my book, Fistful of Gold. Um, literally, this book is full of information about prospecting, about research, how to find your own gold, geology of plaster deposits, geology of hard rock deposits. I mean, it's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about prospecting, from simple panning, sluicing, and metal detecting, all the way up to, uh, you know, really more detailed stuff, even talks a little bit about uh, commercial operations, but there's a lot about maps and satellite photos and that kind of stuff too. It's 350 plus pages long. So there's loads of information and it's available now on Amazon. Just uh, go to Amazon and look up Fistful of Gold by Chris Ralph and I guarantee you'll find it. I also have a website and it has all kinds of information on gold and gemstones and related stuff. The URL for it is nevadaoutbackgems.com, prospect, chrisprospect.htm. I think you'll find this uh, uh, website of use uh, also. And if you like this presentation and you want to learn more about finding your own gold, well, I got more gold, silver, and gemstone videos coming, and the summer will be these slide presentations, but a lot of the ones to come are going to be live action videos out in the field where we do some adventure. I'm going to take you out and we're going to explore old mines together. You're going to get to see what I do and uh, and just, you know, basically you're going to be part of the experience. So click on the subscribe button and hit the notification bell as well and YouTube will let you know when I publish some new stuff. And also hit the like button for this video and uh, feel free to comment or ask questions below. And until next time, uh, Good luck in all your prospecting, and I wish you the best of success.